thank you, uh, Pastor Gwen, um, for sharing with us the beautiful prayer, reminding us the presence of our God in this chaotic, uncertain world that we live in. So uh, one of the things that's on my bucket list in life, and I know some of you might find this weird, but that's okay. I really, really want to go to a brand new Chick-fil-A opening. I want to be one of those people who camps out overnight waiting to get my year's worth of Chick-fil-A meals. I, I missed an opportunity when we lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma. There was a, there was a brand new Chick-fil-A that was opening up right around the corner, and I chickened out. I just came up with that. That wasn't in my notes, by the way. I chickened out. I did not go to that brand new Chick-fil-A opening, but I want to so bad. I want to stay up all night and wait, and that's, something I'm, that's what I'm going to do with my son. I, he doesn't know it yet. He's, it's going to be on his, his uh, bucket list, too. Um, but one of these days, I want to be a part of that, right? There is something about being a part of a, of a brand new a movement, a brand new opening. Uh, uh, in fact, there have been marketing studies that, that people have done that show that people love to, to win things, right? They love to be first. They love to be a part of something that maybe not everybody is a part of. You know what I'm talking about? Like there, there, there's something about being first, to, first to have something or, or being part of only a select few to have access to something. You know who, who does this really well also? And, and Brian, I'm sorry. I know Brian works for Microsoft, but um, Apple does this really well. You ever been to, uh, to a, when they, then they have the brand new iPhone that comes out and the lines that people wait in to get, a, even if they bought a brand new iPhone the year before, the newest one coming out, they got to have it, right? And, and Apple has done such a, 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 an interesting job of getting people to really feel like they're part of a, a family of products, right? Like, like you, uh, there, there's something unique about them. There's, there's something about, about how uh, they operate. And for a lot of people... It is the lines of people and the excitement and the buzz created by the interest that draws other people to it, right? Just wanting to be a part of that. And I guarantee you, there are people who have no idea what they really want. They have no idea what they're really even in line to buy. They don't even know how much it's going to cost them when they get to the checkout place. They just want to be a part of the next big thing, right? Yeah? You know what I'm talking about. They don't even know. You ever committed yourself to something without really knowing what it would take? <laughs> so you laughed at those Apple people, right? It's like when, you, uh, when you're when you talking about maybe getting a pet. And we have put off getting a pet in our house. We had put it off for many, many years. As the kids were getting older, we are like, no, no. Because Becky and I know what goes in to having a pet, right? And they wanted a dog. It was always about a puppy. Every Christmas, a puppy this, a puppy that. Dad, I want a puppy for my birthday. Mm hmm And we would always say, the famous parent words, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. Well, finally, we got to the year where they weren't going to put up with any more talking. They wanted a dog. And so, sure enough, we decided to get a hamster. We didn't really know what all went into getting a hamster, but we thought that would be better because the other option was either snakes or lizards, and, and, and those are fine if you like those things, but Becky and I were really into furry mammals, and so we thought that would be more appropriate. Now, we didn't know what went into having hamsters, and, and to be fair, this did follow three dead fish and two dead um, hermit crabs, and so we decided to try a hamster, uh, a little bit more engaging. A little bit more fun, a little more, more active. We didn't know that those little critters like to stay up all night long and run on those spinning wheels that make noise. We didn't know that the, the cages had a distinct smell and you had to clean those cages out at least once a week. 
We didn't know. We didn't know what it would take. And we had no idea that the kids' interests, oh, they wanted a pet. We didn't know that their interests would die after three days. <laughs> we had no idea what we were getting into. They were just, it was just a cute little critter. And we didn't know. But I would imagine that all of us have experienced that at some point in our lives, right? All of us have experienced some level of that. In fact, Dusty talked about this last week, about how if you're, if you're in a dating relationship or you've been in a dating relationship, there's only so long that you are in it that, that you have to make a decision whether to go to the next level or to cut bait, right? You have to decide what you're going to do. And in fact, the whole idea of marriage counseling is, is going through this process of trying to understand what it's about, what you're getting into, what you're expecting, the good, the bad, the ugly trying to prepare for what's ahead we've been talking about this upside down kingdom that Jesus ushered into existence that Jesus brought basically the kingdom of heaven the kingdom of God the kingdom of heaven coming upon the earth and throughout Jesus' ministry, throughout his time of, of talking about this kingdom and, and all that he did, he was trying to prepare his followers for what to expect. He tries to give them a heads up. He wants them to understand that everything they had grown up hearing, the way they saw the world, the way they saw life, the way they understood power and status, the way they saw greatness... And most importantly, that the way to have eternal life, this, this abundant life, this life that is full of joy and grace, this fulfilling life, in order to have eternal life, the way to have it is found in an upside-down kingdom. It's upside down because it's found in the most unlikely places. It's upside down because the most vulnerable are the most vulnerable are the greatest among us. It's upside down because in order listen, in order to see it, in order to experience all of that that we just talked about, in order to see it in the most unlikely places, in order to be able to see that the most vulnerable are the greatest among us, see, you have to come to a place where you decide, is Jesus? better, better than anything in your life. <laughs> and listen, part of this living in, in this upside down kingdom is coming to a place where you're always seeking out what it even means for Jesus to be better. To seek this kingdom first. And while there are, ups, there are aspects of this upside down kingdom that are hard to understand. There are others that Jesus is very, very clear about. He's been very clear about what matters most. He's very clear about who matters most. He's been very clear that this kingdom will cost something because it's so different. And at times, this kingdom is in complete contrast with the kingdoms of this world. And here it is. From the beginning, Jesus makes it clear that it will cost him something. And we're going to look at Matthew chapter 20. And once again, Jesus is trying to prepare his disciples, his followers, in verse 17, for what is ahead of them. For what this kingdom coming to earth will cost him. Listen to what he says. He, he's, he's headed into Jerusalem. This is, this is on his way to that monumental moment when he eventually goes to the cross. It says, as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside privately and told them what was going to happen to him. Listen, he said. We're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die. They will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, flogged, 
and whipped and crucified. But on the third day, he will be raised from the dead. See, Jesus is trying to, to prepare them for exactly what is about to happen. That their leader, their organizer, their re revolutionary teacher, the one who has performed all these miracles, the one who has escaped assassination attempts, the one who has walked on water, now he's talking about being mocked. He's talking about being beaten. He's talking about dying. And not just in some obscure way. He's talking about dying a criminal's death. And of course he says he'll be raised from the dead, but that only happens after all that other horrible stuff happens to him. And you would have thought that, that they would have stopped right in that moment and tried to understand what he's talking about. Maybe have allowed that to, to soak in, to, to, to try to grasp, what do you mean you're going to be mocked? What do you mean you're going to be beaten? You're going to suffer? What, what does this mean that this is going to happen to you? But instead, in this moment right here, some of them decide to ask him another question. Let's pick it up in verse 20. It said, then the, the mother of, of James and John, two disciples, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request, he asked. And she replied, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. Who knew? They had Democrats and Republicans back then, right? But Jesus answered by saying to them, listen, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Oh, yes, they said. We are able. And Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup. But I have no right to say who will sit on my right, right or left. My Father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. And when the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, how could they get to Jesus first? <laughs> Man, there's nothing like having a mom in your corner, is there? You know what I mean? Moms know best. And man, James and John's mom had been listening and watching. And some have, have said that maybe even James and John had, had put her up to it, but, but chances are they'd all been eyeing this together, and, and she simply wanted the best for her boys. And no one could blame her, right? She thinks she knows exactly what they need. She sees the prize, and no one else has asked for it. So she approaches Jesus, it says, with reverence and respect. And Jesus asks her, what is it that I can do for you? What, what is your request? And this mom goes for the big one. In this new kingdom, Jesus, this, this kingdom that, that you are bringing, this, this new kingdom that is about to take over, the one where you are going to, to make Israel powerful and dominant again, this kingdom where, where Israel will once again be on top of it all. Can my two boys be on your right and your left? Stuff. Please give them power right next to you, Right? See, her vision and the other's visions, this is what they saw. This is what they saw in Jesus. This is what she saw in Jesus. This is what they wanted from him from the very beginning. This was the desires of their hearts. A better Israel, maybe even a more just, a more powerful. And, and was that bad that they wanted that? Was it bad that they wanted to have a restored kingdom? Was it bad that they simply wanted things to go back to the way they were in the good old days? When David was on his throne, when the world as they knew it respected them as a people, 
finally, they would be power players again in the world, right? Right? But listen, here it is. If we're not careful, the longing for our past can keep us from seeing the future God has for us. You hear me? The longing for our past, if we're not careful, can keep us from seeing the future God has for us. This is where they are, right? This whole time, the filter in which they hear Jesus and see Jesus through, all of it runs through their longing for a repeat of their past. Even the past of the stories they had read. Maybe they thought that, that God would, would have vengeance and, and kill everyone who disagreed with them, just like they had heard from the Old Testament stories. All the sinful, all the wicked, evil people, all the evil empire, the evil non believers. And they are so sure that this is the way it's going to be. When Jesus asked them, I mean, he even asked them, Are you able to drink from the same bitter cup of suffering? It's like they didn't even think about it. They immediately said, Yes, of course we are even when they had no idea what that meant. Only that somehow they were going to come out on top. They are are basically saying they are willing to suffer, probably even die, listen, for the wrong idea of Jesus. Let that sink in for a moment. There is such a thing as the wrong idea about Jesus but they couldn't see it. You see, anything polar opposite of of who Jesus is, of the way Jesus lived, of, of what Jesus talked about, no matter how people try to justify it or stretch it, there are clearly wrong ideas about Jesus. There are clearly wrong ideas about this kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, and what it's all about. And Jesus hears them. Jesus sees what's going on. And so Jesus decides to clear it up again, to try to help them see. We're going to look in verse 25. We're going to keep going. So it says, but Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your, what, servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Man, that sounds good, but boy, is that not upside down? <laughs> I mean, after that exchange with the, with the mom of, of James and John and, and with those other disciples, can you imagine what that must have been like to hear Jesus talk like this? They go from asking to to be the top dogs in this new government to Jesus telling them that if they want to be at the top, they have to be willing to give power away. That's not something we're hearing these days, is it? (laughs) See, there's... Well, hold the phone. See, Jesus draws this very distinct contrast. This is how the kingdoms of this world operate. Theirs is a pursuit of power at any cost. Theirs celebrates the people who have everything. Theirs is a power structure that is meant to always remind people where they are in the pecking order of society. That's what the kingdoms of this world are all about. When I first moved here, I, I met someone who, uh, who was really, really high up in, uh, in one of the, the big, big companies here in Charlotte. He's a follower of Jesus. 
and he was telling me that he was getting ready to fly out the next day to, to go and, and visit factories they have all over the world. And he said to me, he said, Aaron, it is so important for me, even, even though I'm so high up in the company, for me to go out here and to be with those who are on the ground, to remind them that, that I am not somebody who's so far away and so out of touch with where they are. And he said, it's so important to the, to the culture of the company for them to know that they matter no matter where they are in the structure of the organization. And they've begun to work on creating a healthy culture. He said, where people are valued. And Jesus is talking here about a culture created by the kingdom of heaven. And of course, there's got to be people who are in charge, and there's got to be order. But I promise you, and, and I've been to enough, enough leadership conferences to know this, that the very best leaders are the ones who serve those around them. But then Jesus brings us all the way back around to what he will do. He makes it very clear that not only is he telling them that this is what this kingdom is all about, he also makes it clear that he will show them with his own life, he says, for even the Son of Man came not to be served. Not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. If we're honest, we want to talk about uncomfortable. What an uncomfortable image this is. Let's get real. The very God of the whole universe, right? In the very form of a human being. And I think for those of us who are followers of Jesus, for those of us who have been engaged in this faith for a long time, this may very well be one of the most uncomfortable truths that we have to wrestle with. Because we do not like, we really do not like this idea of Jesus serving people. We are great with him going to the cross. He, he goes by himself in our minds. He pays the ultimate price. And we can get on to the resurrection and we can even see ourselves sitting on the right or left of Jesus. But to see God, to see God as a servant, maybe it's just me, but I think if we're really honest, we don't really care about this part of Jesus. I mean, this does not line up with, with all of our posts on Facebook, right? The ones where we're telling all those people in that political party how bad they are. Or the posts where we're telling all those people how stupid they are. Or those posts where we're spreading gossip about those kind of people. Hmm. I've really come to learn over my years in ministry, and even in my own life, that there are certain aspects of Jesus we'd all really like to ignore. See, Jesus doesn't fit nicely into our one-issue voting box. Jesus doesn't give us permission to be driven by jealousy over what our neighbors have. Jesus doesn't excuse our greediness. Jesus doesn't excuse our policies that keep people in poverty for our power advantage. Jesus says, I want you to serve and give your power away for the sake of others. Serving without an expectation. Serving simply because you are loved and you know it. Loved by the creator of the whole world. Serve. This is why this past summer we announced the three values, main goals that we have here at Pineville Church to, to serve our community, to grow our faith, and to care about our world. To serve our community. And really the, the thought was not only that we would serve it here in the Pineville area, because so many of us come from all over the Charlotte metro area, from, from Rock Hill and Matthews to those who are watching online all over the world. But collectively, we serve the world around us and we serve one another. We serve those who are different than we are, just like who you were praying about. We serve and we are the body of Jesus that gives our lives for the sake of others. 
just like Jesus. See, in the upside down kingdom of heaven, the center of power is found in our willingness to give it away. Now, Matthew goes on, and as he wraps up this next section, talks about these two blind men who had been blind for a long, long time. It's the end of, of and, and, and it's the, the Jesus' final miracle before he goes to the cross. It's an illustration of exactly how this kingdom operates, exactly what Jesus has been talking about. And we're going to look at it here. Verse 29, it says, As Jesus and the disciples left the town of Jericho, a large crowd followed behind Two blind men were sitting beside the road, and when they heard that Jesus was coming that way, they began shouting, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Be quiet. Can you just hear the crowd saying, Be quiet. Stop it. Don't bother him. But they only shouted louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when Jesus heard them, ha! <laughs> He stopped and called, what do you want me to do for you? Just like he said to the mom, the two disciples. Lord, they said, we want to see. And Jesus felt sorry for them. He had empathy and touched their eyes. Instantly, they could see. I love this here. It says, then they followed him. <laughs> here is this instance where Jesus is literally the most important public figure walking with a the crowd. They're on their way to this big event in Jerusalem. This is why James and John and, and the, their mom was, was so interested in, in trying to, to get their place next to Jesus because they knew this big event was about to take place. They knew that, that the power paradigm was about to shift. And they're on their way to this big festival celebration. The atmosphere is electrifying. Anyone who wants to be someone wants to be hanging out with Jesus. They want to be close to him. They want to be part of this next big thing. Just like in the, the Apple line for that iPhone. They want to be a part of the next wave. They want to be a part of this new government that's going to make everything better. And they're walking along. When these two nobodies get in the way... These two nobodies that yell, Jesus, Lord. And they say, Son of David, they know who he is. And they cry out to him. But do you see what this crowd does? And it goes back to that point earlier when those disciples and, and the mother didn't see Jesus. See, the crowd was so convinced and so into Jesus being what they thought he should be. They were willing to try to shut these guys up. See, what they had in mind for Jesus caused them to treat people who actually needed help with deep contempt. Think about that. Do you hear what I'm saying? Talk about lessons in missing a point. And there's a lot of research here about this particular story that says that, that what Matthew, the writer of this particular scripture, was, was trying to get across was to draw parallels between these two blind men and the two disciples that wanted to be on Jesus' right and left. See, one set was so sure that they could see, but they were actually spiritually blind. The other two were blind and they knew they needed Jesus in order to really see. The one set could only see what they had in mind for Jesus to be. The other set 
They saw because Jesus healed their blindness. And as we wrap up this series, as we go into this week of unsettledness and, and, and chaos and possibly just uncharted territories, where the news is going to get loud and bad and where people are going to be angry, where people are going to be hurting, where people are going to be scared. They are looking for someone to lead them to something better. Listen, the upside down kingdom is only visible to those willing to let Jesus open their eyes to it. And he's talking to us on the inside of the church. Those of us who think we see, but we have to be very careful that we have not made up our minds so much that we are actually spiritually blind. We have to be very careful that we're not so in love with the idea of Jesus that's wrong that we try to push away those who are crying out for help the kingdoms of this world this week and they've been hard at work at this the kingdoms of this world on the right and on the left They really do see Jesus as a threat. We'll talk about this tonight at the Be Known for Love rally, and I hope you'll tune in. It'll be online only, but the kingdom of heaven is the better way. The kingdom of heaven is the only way that will lead us home, that will lead us back to the peace that the creator of the whole world can offer us. Let's stand together. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes if you're watching online? I just want to say a prayer with you today. These two questions. What do you desire? What does the desire of your heart reveal about who Jesus is to you? Seriously. Are you looking for the one who says, you have to serve If you want to lead, you lay down your life for others. Jesus invites us to this, into this kingdom, this upside down kingdom. Father, thank you for the sense of your presence we have felt today the reminder <laughs> the reminder that there is nothing in this world that could ever happen to stop your kingdom the choice is ours we can either be a part of it or we can turn our faces and our eyes away from it will you help us today to embrace your kingdom it's in your name I pray. Amen.